Dr. John Glazer is very well known, uh, one of the uh, uh, leaders in, in health informatics. As some of you know that he was uh, a VP and CIO. I got the, the title wrong, but, but the number one guy in terms of, of information uh, at the uh, Parker's Healthcare System. Of course, as I said before earlier, if you were there, we moved up all the names of the Harvard Hospital. But, not the ones for us now. but, but uh, well, one thing that people don't move up is that they are and have been, thanks uh, in large part to Don, you know, among leaders uh, in the Hopkins, we point to them all the time, so that's a pretty good thing. Uh, as being a, a leader in the use of information in uh, academic medicine. And some of you uh, are now, and you also, uh, uh, I knew you had a PhD, but I didn't know you had had a, a 150 articles in books. How many CIOs are there that have 150 articles in books? So that's very impressive, particularly uh, for an academic. And impressive, the non-academics is the CEO of uh, Siemens Healthcare. And uh, we all know the importance of uh, very many, many different things. And so uh, and we know the importance of Siemens here. Anyway. So I will sit down and turn it over to, to, to John, and like we did this morning, I hope that we could, uh, could um, have, uh, all the way, um, uh, we, we can then have a discussion that way, um, uh, John will be about the things that he's been here since the beginning. So thank you, John, for, for joining us. Yeah, thank you, John. I'm, I'm John Glasser, by the way. Um, I just want to make sure, are the mics working? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, is, I'm very badly colorblind. Uh, and so I said, well, with the green light, you're good. <laughs> you know, and it's like uh, I sit in lots of project review meetings, and green is good, and red is bad. I get the yellow thing, but I have no idea whether we're in, a, in good shape or horrible shape. I think of the color. Um, just say a quick vignette, and we'll get on to the content. And some of you may have heard this. When I was 18, I tried to join the submarine fleet. Because uh, I was a bad high school kid. I was actually expelled from high school my junior year. I got in a lot of trouble. And my grandfather was a big submariner. He said, the submarine fleet will turn you into a real man. Admiral Rickover. Some of you are old enough to remember. No, Admiral Rickover knows how to take young people, turn them into real men. I had no idea what a real man was, but shoot, if I'm going to be a man, I want to be a real man, not just a regular man. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down to the recruiting office, and uh, they make you take the Farnsworth color test. They flash red and green lights at you, and can you tell red from green? And they started flashing lights, and I started saying red or green, and the officer behind me started laughing. And I said, the officer was probably said, son, I've never seen anybody as bad with red and green as you are. And I said, does that mean I join, can't join the submarine fleet? He said, son, the country's safer if you're far away from nuclear weapons. <laughs> <laughs> now, in retrospect, I'm not sure that would have been the best calling for me, but anyway, a dream dashed uh, at that moment in time. Uh, so I'm going to spend, a, you know, not all that long uh, on this topic uh, that is in front of you, uh, a couple of uh, opening comments. Uh, one is, John gave us some questions to answer, and I, going back to my high school days, decided which ones I would and wouldn't do. Uh, and so you'll see some of those answered, but some of them not. Even the ones that are answered will not be answered well. Uh, but nonetheless, did a little bit of that. The second is, uh, this is from a lot of the comments is from the perspective of a provider. So we've worked at a provider health system for 22 years, a really long time. And the work that we do now in Siemens is largely to help people who are providers. So this is not health plan orientation or public health. So you'll see that sort of bias that goes on there. Um, I have three major <coughs> pieces to the comments. Uh, one is some general observations. And these are the types of observations I think invariably you ought to make before you sit down and craft an <coughs> IT solution. Step back and look at the nature of what you're trying to deal with and have certain ideas guide you in the course of doing that. The second is kind of where are we, and of course I touched upon some of this, is in our evolution as a country, you know, to getting the foundation in, the electronic health record, interoperability, et cetera, kind of where are we. And then the third is some R&D agenda items, which are more informatics uh, in orientation or, or computer science in orientation rather than uh, sort of payment changes, et cetera. So we'll cover those uh, sort of three major areas here. Let me start with the first, and that is, uh, you know, Taking a quote uh, from, uh, you can see the, the authors and the uh, source here, is this notion of the group of individuals. Who defines the group of individuals? And largely believe it will be defined by those who are paying for the care. So this is the group that matters. This is the definition of the people who ought to be part of it. And the people who pay for care will define here are the outcomes that are of interest to me. And that's how it will get set, you know, by and large for practical purposes for most providers. Now, I suspect that that leads to and is leading to a fairly broad definition of groups. 
you know, traditionally in my senses, and having listened to some of the conversation this morning, we tend to view groups of people with a particular disease, you know, chronic disease, or all the healthcare that a geographic uh, location would need. Uh, but readmissions, people who are discharged, are a group, are a group of interest with a certain outcome in mind. Um, people who are undergoing a total hip or knee replacement are a group with a certain outcome in mind. So we'll have a sort of broad speciation uh, the definition of group and the outcomes that matter. Some will have quite clear temporal boundaries. Uh, some might be long, some might be short. Some will be quite monothread, you know, particular disease. Some will have multiple diseases, et cetera. So that's a sense, is that the sort of notion of group and sort of what it means to manage a population uh, will become much more expansive. Now, what this means, obviously, is the, is the idiosyncratic nature of this will become much more significant. Not only does it get broader, I mean, there are sort of terms and categories perhaps not part of the normal discourse, um, but as you know, different pairs have different ideas about who ought to be in the group and what the outcomes ought to be, et cetera. So we've got a very complex landscape uh, that is opening up in this broad notion of managing population. Now, for those of us in the sort of IT business who say, let's create uh, solutions, some of that word solution, uh, you know, for these folks, is that whatever technology you have ought to be leverageable across all groups. And so the way that you manage a pathway or a plan of care ought to be the same across this whole set here. Um, the way that you have messaging to people about what ought to happen next ought to be the same across the board. So what you don't want to do is a different set of IT approaches across each of these kinds of things. So there's a complexity and an inconsistency that will occur. So that's observation number one. is sort of broader a sense of group uh, and outcomes that go with group and who actually will set this. The second is this process here, which is pretty normative, <clears throat> and all that um, radical here is the starting at the top right, sort of one o'clock, uh, two o'clock, who are we responsible for, not always trivial to do. Uh, what's the plan? Uh, what is the care plan that goes with each person in that however we define the population? So this could be, what's the plan for the 22-year-old who's pretty healthy? What's the plan for a middle-aged guy like John who's decaying rapidly? Uh, in fact, you can pieces fall as I stand before you. Uh, and what's the plan for someone who's quite elderly with multiple issues and challenges? So it's got to be a plan. Uh, and we're looking for deviation from that plan. You know, where, and what do we need to do to make sure that plan is, in a proactive way, followed, et cetera. We get to risk. And the one way to view risk, or way I like to view it, is what's the risk they won't follow the plan? You know, and so that's the risk here. If there's very little risk, they won't follow the plan. We have a different approach. It's goodness gracious, they're poor. And so following certain elements of the plan, like picking up medications with high copays, are at risk. You know, if we don't do something, so risk has got a meaning of conformance to plan. And then you go through the usual engage in lots of different ways. Uh, I still think we are searching for the right way to invoke the technology to engage patients. Uh, I teach a course at Wharton on e-health. I love the you know, 14 classes, three hours with a room full of 60 people who are way too young to be this smart and this accomplished. Uh, and what is striking to me is the fascination with computer, with consumer-based technology and the still naive belief that that is the silver bullet to the broad challenges that we have. So we still have to calibrate the right way to invoke or utilize the technology. You can see the sort of around the loop here. Now the basic idea here is at times I think in the population public health management, we have a sort of central idea. And the central idea can be the intervention. You know, let's, let's cut down on sodium. You know, let's get everybody to <coughs> stop smoking. And sort of this. That's how we view the world. We've got a programmatic initiative that cuts across. That's what is the sort of central idea here. Another central idea is the chronic disease, for example. We're going to go after the asthmatics. You know, we're going to go after the congestive heart failure, et cetera. Et cetera. So those are all relevant, but the central idea is the plan that a person has. That's the central idea. What is the plan for every single person that we're covering? Now, we might see cross-cutting. They smoke, so we got to get them in this intervention. We might see part of the plan that obviously takes into account their diabetics. So ought to be part. The central idea is the plan. And so I got to make sure, we all have to make sure, what's the plan? Is it tailored by risk, tailored by preferences, et cetera? And then part of the technology obviously has to say, are they on plan or off? Did something happen that suggests deviation? Seen in the emergency room last night, that's not on the plan. Uh, I didn't pick up the prescription, that's not on the plan either. So we had to know when there's deviation. And to the degree we want to be proactive about the plan, let's remind them to come in for their appointment, let's go be proactive about the plan. The core idea is the plan, uh, which these others contribute to its formation, but are not the central idea. So in a way, managing uh, population is all about managing individuals according to a plan, and then some measurement and aggregate, how well am I doing? and my overall management are particular slices of that as we go forward here. 
Third idea, and this is quite uh, true at HIMSS. I don't know how many of you go to HIMSS. You know, if, if you're in the healthcare IT business, it's a required religious event. Uh, it uh, may raise Catholic quite familiar the notion of sin, venial, and mortal that cause you to spend time in a bad place. Uh, and failing to attend HIMSS in the healthcare IT business adds another 10 years to purgatory or hell or whatever the world you think you're destined for. Uh, actually, quick note here. Being old Catholic, one of the basic idea, good, good deeds cancel out of bad deeds. When you, go to, when you die, it would be net zero, okay? The problem is, I don't know where I am, okay? So I've written to the Pope. I said, I want a monthly statement. I want to plus 500 minus 500. If I'm plus 500, I can sin. I've got some opportunities. If I'm minus 500, I'm going to do a good deed or two until I get back to zero. Having said that, so okay, net zero is the idea. Why be a saint? What is the point, okay? Because plus 1,000 is sins wasted. You know what I'm saying here? So what's the point? So I'm convinced that there are valuable prizes on the other side. So for plus 500, you get a condo upgrade. 1,000, you get free you know, membership in Heaven's Golf Club, et cetera. Anyway, I asked the Pope for the catalog, so I can just you know, do my money. I'll ask wait, that's not why you're here. Uh, but it's important. That's probably all you remember out of the conversation. <laughs> so the point is, uh, you know, hymns, uh, you know, the floor was full of population management. You know, we got all the tools, this, that, and the other. And the basic sort of underlying idea there is you got a suite of stuff, revenue cycle and HR, and now you need another application to do population management and maybe throw in some analytics to do that. It's an additive thing. And that's true. I mean, there is some additive stuff here. But the assumption is the rest of your suite is untouched. That ain't true at all. And so part of the notion of population and everything that you have is touched by this basic idea. You know, obviously, in the electronic health record, and a lot of them do this today, but it's worth, is do I have the ability to do a reminder? If I have team-based care, is there a work list that's shared by the team, you know, that the social worker, the nurse, the physician, and the patient uh, contribute to? In my revenue cycle, I may need to group charges, you know, across multiple care settings, across time, roll them up into a charge grouper for submission under a bundle or a payment. So the point is, everything is touched, not only at the feature function level, but also at a more systemic baseline level which is, is a lot of the systems in the market today are very transaction oriented, you know, process a claim, retrieve a result, write a prescription, et cetera. And increasingly, these have to be intelligent transactions, just as when you order a book at Amazon and it comes by with all these other ideas to, you know, people like you bought the following other things, uh, is increasingly this notion of the property of intelligence uh, that is guiding activities and decisions across the board. So this is actually quite invasive in a lot of ways. This notion of managing a population, however defined, or whatever basis it is, becomes a very invasive aspect of the, of the technologies that we have today. It is more than adding a tool, even though you still think, I believe, you have to have the tool. So those are three fundamental observations about what this means. It's sort of the nature that there's a species of populations uh, this idea that it's actually quite invasive in what it does, and this idea that the plan and monitoring the performance on a plan is the core idea upon which you design a lot of stuff. Now, where are we? And this is, you get this stuff flying in from the side. Um, and I never know how to do it, but I'm glad that people do. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, if you see, look at the foundational part of this thing, uh, we're, we're making a lot of progress. And I remember when I had the fortune of being, um, and <coughs> as far as I had mentioned there's some of this stuff earlier, part of the ONC team early on when a lot of the meaningful use stuff was put together and programs were put together. And one of the basic ideas behind it, Yale was there too, uh, basic ideas there was, you know, lay the foundation of the EHR and interoperability so you give people a head start so that when payment reform comes, that foundation will be set or at least fairly far along. And so one of the questions is how are we doing on this foundation? Now, in a lot of ways, pretty darn neat. I mean, this is, you know, you can see the growth here, and uh, I know that the attestation refers to Medicare and Medicaid, so you can say, well, who's really doing it, this, that, and the other. But that being said, there's some really impressive growth on adoption and a use. I mean, more than just showing the receipt, I got my EHR, here's the receipt, give me my money, uh, that there's real use here. The physician is impressive, too, although not as impressive. And here you can see the physician adoption rates over time. Uh, this is CDC. Uh, uh, National Center for Health Statistics uh, data. Um, and you see 78.4, although the 48.1 is basic. And so the real types of systems that are capable of doing a lot of what we need to have done is the delta between the two, which is about 30%. So there's, but nonetheless, uh, really good traction uh, that has occurred in terms of our uh, uh, pickup and laying down of the foundation here. And even the exchange, and we'll come back to sort of, there's a difference between exchange and interoperability, but at least at the exchange level, uh, some good pickup and adoption of exchange technology. 
largely private, people doing private exchanges with their health system or their ACO, not as much on the regional or statewide, uh, with some exceptions, but nonetheless, uh, there's still a fair amount of HIE activity. And actually, I think one of the great accomplishments in the modern era of IT is this graph here. Uh, and in particularly with the folks at SureScripts, but a lot of other folks who really moved the needle on e-prescribing in a remarkably short period of time. Um, and so the federal government was involved with incentives, a wide variety of players came together. Uh, and so some very substantive movement has occurred, uh, again, in a fairly short period of time. Plus, last but not least, is the quantified self. You know, the things that my students like you know, talking about is sort of measuring, hey, one student who actually measures his, the surface temperature of his wrist hourly and tracks it. I think, what are you, out of your mind? Uh, I have no idea what he does with that. But nonetheless, and I, I, don't, you know, I don't know how many of you have a Fitbit on you at this, at this moment. You know, what's wrong with the rest of you? Uh, but anyway, you know, there's a lot of interesting and novel technology that measures all kinds of stuff on the quantified self, both those who are into it and those who have uh, uh, health reasons to, uh, and to do this kind of stuff. So lots of progress, lots of progress technically, lots of progress in awareness, lots of progress as a result of federal incentive programs uh, and uh, the industry as a role. However, we still have challenges. One is there is some evidence, I'm not sure that it's how solid it is quite yet, that the adoption is slowing, and particularly on the physician side. We may peak at meaningfully use below 50%, uh, because <coughs> see, you can see some of the data here. A lot of, and you hear from a bunch of stuff's too damn hard to use. I don't really like it. Or there were a thousand vendors who were certified for stage one, a hundred for stage two. A lot of people got left holding the bag. You know, I you know, bought it from these guys, and golly, they're gone, uh, and they're not going to do stage two. I've had more than one physician tell me that says, listen, I think, and whether they're right or wrong, it doesn't matter, they think, is that the productivity tip hit I took with the EHR is costing me more than the incentive I'm getting. Forget it. Uh, I'd rather actually deliver paper care and see more patients per unit of time, so screw this nonsense. I mean, it sort of fundamentally hasn't happened. So we're seeing some slowness on the, on the physician side with a possible peak sub 50%. Uh, I also suspect as we look across the landscape of hospitals trying to get to stage two, man, they are puffing hard. Uh, and there is the never say die attitude. It kind of reminds me of the NCAA tournament year. You know, it's the coach is down by 12 of 24 <coughs> seconds left and is still fouling. You know, come on, cut it, give me a break, it's over. Um, and some of these guys will do the, they'll, they'll go till the midsummer and then punt uh, at this point in time. So worried a lot about the stage two, in particular the year with ICD-10, which is just adding an amazing amount of uh, stress to them. So we have a big, terrific curve, but we're at some risk of falling short, uh, frankly, from where we all would have collectively aspired to be on laying this uh, foundation here. The other is, while it is narrowing, it's still there, is the gap between the larger organizations, the urban organizations, providers, and those who are rural uh, or smaller uh, in terms of EHR adoption and meaningful use. Now, this is, you know, as a policy matter, gaps are not good, you know, and particularly the belief system that EHRs provide value, so having a good chunk of the population uh, accessible to them is not a good policy outcome. And as you all know, the shape of healthcare in this country is a whole lot of small organizations and a lot fewer larger organizations. So the, you know, we're having this huge swath uh, that is occurring here. So we're at some risk of a divide. There's a divide now, but some risk of the divide doesn't narrow sufficiently. Uh, and we wind up uh, short, which means that the foundation for a lot of what we're trying to do here just won't be there uh, because the systems will not be in place. Similarly, interoperability is hard. This is some work from Athena Health. I don't know if you all know who Athena Health is, but they do practice management systems in a cloud basis, and they take care of a lot of the integration work behind the scenes uh, for the physician. So one of the things they do is they say, we'll get your lab results into the electronic health record that you use from us. And you can see on the left of all the labs they deal with, 38% are still coming in paper as of last year. Now, a lot of these are tiny little labs. I mean, they're small hospital labs or physician office labs or tiny little labs. But 38% last year were still paper coming through. If you go to the right, those that are electronic, to what degree did they follow the link standard? Uh, most did not. The uh, vast majority did not. So there's exchange going on on the right. They're getting it electronically, but this is not interoperability because of the wide variation of code sets and semantics and all the other stuff that is going on here. So while exchange is up, interoperability is what we would ought to mean is still lagging for a bunch of uh, reasons. And to a degree, the labs are left out of the HR incentive program, so they have no motive to change and lots of reasons for making this happen. 
The other, and I think perhaps more material <laughs> from my perspective, I spend a reasonable portion of my life you know, going out and visiting customers, partly to see how well we're doing, but also just to keep your finger on the pulse of where are they and how is this affecting them, et cetera. And often, you wind up across the table from the C-suite, as they're called, and you look at them, and these are good people. They're smart people, they're working hard, they're committed to their community, they have been for a long time, you know, that's why they're there. And you talk to them about, well, let's see, you're gonna have to deal with managing populations, you're gonna have to deal with patient-centered medical homes, you're gonna have to deal with a series of analytics that are new to you. And you look at them, and you realize they're not ready at all for this. They actually don't know how to do this stuff. You know, the physicians they have in the primary care clinics actually don't know how to do preventive care. They know how to hand out the brochure, stop smoking and badger you. You know, like the nuns used to badger me, they know how to badger you. Um, but you know, they, but they actually don't know how to engage in a lot of ways. You know, we can talk about, boy, you gotta be using more nurse practitioners and other healthcare professionals, and they actually, yeah, yeah but they don't know how to do it. So part of the, the concern is the incredible change that is going to arrive here. And I think we're in the early stages of the most profound decade healthcare has seen in this country in a very, very long period of time. And maybe you have to go back to the Flexner Report. I honestly don't know how long you have to go back before you see this thing. Uh, and we've got a huge set of the country not ready for this and not knowing how to do this. Maybe the saving grace is consolidation, which will sort of spread some you know, very scarce uh, but important resources over a larger phase. But most of them do not know how to engage in material change. You can read this as well as I can read this to you. And that is part of the foundation is obviously IT. But actually more important than that is the ability to actually use the IT to affect change. So a great study here, it was not on this slide here, it was actually done by using folks from MIT, it's sponsored by Capgemini. Looked across a number of, several hundred for-profit organizations along two variables. How IT intensive were you? How much investment had you made? Presumably astute. Uh, the second is how good were you at managing change? And they did the classic two by two table. Now if you were lousy at both and you took the average profitability, you were about 24% below the average profitability. You stunk at both. If you were terrific at both, you were about 26% ahead of it, typical for your industry profitability. What was interesting is the other two cells. So if you were great at change management but had underinvested in IT, you were about 11, 12% above profitability above norm. If you were great at IT but lousy at change management, you were about 9% below profitability. And the basic message is that the ability to manage change is much more important than the IT you invest in here. So we get all kinds of great adoption, but if we fail here, we will fail broadly. So those are some of the challenges that we have. And in the prior session was asked, I think it's gonna be a long, complicated, bumpy road, is because largely this, uh, and also some IT groundwork uh, to cover. So uh, if I had to guide national priorities, uh, including research uh, and development, uh, this is what I would do. One is I would solidify this foundation. Listen, we spent, I don't know, 20 billion or wherever we are in meeting for these dollars, something along those lines, on a lot of time and effort. Let's get this base solved. And there may be a need for some mid-course correction to say, listen, we've launched this amazingly ambitious program with a lot of moving parts to transform a very complex industry, and maybe we gotta tune parts of it, either because we've evol you know, evolution has occurred or certain ideas didn't work out like we thought, whatever, that's fine. I mean, that's sort of, you would expect that in the course of a complex program involving this many moving parts across an industry this uh, diverse here. So there's a series of how do we get these guys ready to engage in the types of change, and here I believe, that professional societies play an enormously important role. The American Hospital Association, the American College of Healthcare Executives, the American, you know, all the professional societies can help guide their membership and others, uh, along with others, to achieving this. The second is that the closing the gap on the adoption, and particularly in the physician practices, I'm not quite sure what the answer is, uh, and the interoperability, uh, and actually would give the federal government more authority over interoperability and standards than it currently has, uh, but also HIT use, so stuff's hard to use. Remember years ago when I was a CIO at Partners and we were introducing writing prescriptions on the computer and, um, and you compared the tasks, if you had a pad, how long does it take to write a prescription on a pad? About three seconds. If you're really good on the computer, really good, sign on, identify the patient, pick the drug, pick, you know, all that nonsense that you go through, plus a couple of red warnings because, you know, you overdid it on the drug-drug interaction stuff, uh, 45 seconds. You know, if you're really good at doing that kind of stuff, that's a hit, and that's just all there is to it. Uh, plus, we asked them to document a bunch of stuff they weren't doing before, so there's a use problem, uh, and particularly with the externalities that go with that. So there's still some work to be done, and we don't have to wait for this all to be done to keep moving forward, but nonetheless, would solidify the gains and adjust course correction there, too. 
And then you can see the other two, and I think a lot of the inverse reimbursement strategies that we have here, um, it's not obvious yet that they will work. Uh, and it's not obviously what combination will work. That's okay. You know, we're continuing to experiment and to learn with a variety of these things here. But A number one is saying there's big traction that has gone on. Let's take an assessment at it and zero in on how do we adjust and tune them, realizing that's not a one-month discussion. That can be several years of activity that needs to occur. The other is that we will see and need to have happen, and this is what we need to do, and this is what all the vendors need to do, is begin to move from what is, I often think of as the first generation of tools and technologies along those lines to the second generation. Now, and my view is that the first generation <coughs> is largely characterized you focus only on the 5% across the 50%. I get it. Uh, but you also need to focus on the 45% who are on their way to being the 5%. Uh, and you need to keep those who are 22-year-olds and watching their skin temperature, uh, that that's the only health care issue they have to worry about when they're 85. Uh, and so you have to kick up everybody uh, along the way. That guy's got to be a thrill on dates. You know what my skin temperature is right now? <laughs> you are a loser. I hope I get a call that my house is burning. Um, get out of here. Um, so there is. It, so the other is the, we engage a lot of them were fairly static risk categorization, forgetting the fact people move between risks. They're medium risk now, and they're on the way to high risk. So the high risk and on the way to medium is sort of much more dynamic. Um, the third is, is actually this very simple single disease. I got a diabetes registry. I got an asthma registry. I appreciate that, but you got people in both. Uh, and it's not only about that, but it's also a variety of factors called like John. 58-year-old man, and you ought to be getting your colon checked with a certain regularity, and you know this, that, and the other, just to make sure we're doing okay here. Um, the other is what you find in a lot of these cases is it is extraordinarily manually expensive to manage the population, because you wind up with people on the phone and pieces of paper, and in fact, the cost of the labor to manage the population exceeds the reimbursement you're going to get. Uh, and so you see ratios of one care manager per 150 to 300 patients. We need to make that an order of magnitude larger. So it's still very labor intensive to go off and to do this. And a lot of this is being based on claims. And I found out 60 days after the fact that I stunk up the joint 60 days ago, uh, which is obviously not useful for reimbursement or care. So there's this newer generation that is collectively the industry has put forward, which is you manage everybody. Uh, the risk categorization evolves. And again, it's risk in terms of the ability to conform to the plan. Uh, and that's the real risk that we are concerned with. And actually has a multi-disease care plan, so the fusion of all the things that need to go on, mindful of the fact that if you purely do the union, you blow away the doctor's ability to take care of somebody in a 15-minute period of time. Um, and then a fair amount of process automation, automation that says, you missed, the, you missed your scheduled appointment. I'm sending you a message through the portal. Would you like to reschedule? And taking it off the hands of some case manager, et cetera, and sort of spread the work, uh, take care of a lot of the burden, et cetera. And the other is concurrent. I know today that David was seen in the emergency room last night so that I can do something about it today rather than fact, not after the fact. And then last part here. And I apologize for talking fast. I just have so much to say in so little time. Uh, you know, this stuff is, is some informatics uh, challenges. And I don't mean for this to be an exhaustive list, but it's certainly stuff that uh, I've talked about with a number of colleagues, including my colleague Mark Overage sitting over there. Um, one is, is that it is further automation of the process of managing the care uh, and making sure that it does not turn into this god-awful labor expense is to reduce the labor cost of following up, making sure the right person is doing the right thing, et cetera, et cetera. And this particularly becomes challenging when you span organizational boundaries. You say, listen, my set of providers, I own some of them in my health system, but some I have contractual relationships with. And there's a, a, an array of EHRs out there. I will never get to pure homogeneity, but I have to coordinate care across this array of technologies. And so how does one do that in a reasonable way? The second is, um, you know, while we're making progress on HIV and interoperability, it is still amazingly time consuming and expensive to stitch all that stuff through. And so a lot of the blitz going on now to get HIEs connected for stage two is encountering how hard it still is uh, to get all this stuff linked together and do this mapping and take care of that exception to deal with this way older version of the technology, et cetera. So dropping the overhead and the cost uh, of making that happen will be critical. The third is the ability to support a team care team is still quite nascent in most products. We know how to care for, we know how to support a single doctor and their list and their patients or help a nursing unit say these are the senses on our unit. But if we have a team that is spread across a community and a team that can be dynamic because now you need the cardiologist and then we take care of that and the cardiologist is less relevant here is we're actually quite nascent about how to do this. And so the set of technologies that make a very busy team capable of operating as a team this obviously includes the patient, 
uh, is still quite underdeveloped. It ain't Facebook, you know, .net or something along those lines, uh, but it's some kind of set of derivatives of a series of interesting stuff. The other is to essentially engage patients, uh, and we've talked about in this, sort of mentioned this in the technology, and particularly in a non-noisy way, uh, because a lot of these devices spill out an amazing array of stuff, but what's truly relevant in all of this. Um, I remember when I, years ago, I used to, when I was at Partners, I would volunteer to be a human subject in a clinical trial every three years. Nothing too weird, no gene therapy or slice in the open, but you know, I'll, I'll do a human trial. So I remember being on a trial where you ate nothing but uh, no sodium, only potassium, see whether it lowered, they normally lower blood pressure, et cetera. But anyway, about three and a half years ago, I volunteered to be in one at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which was looking at how do you take people who are relatively healthy and, ask, and have them adult healthier behaviors. Uh, I thought, that's this I can do. So I had four healthy behaviors, a multivitamin a day, duck soup. Uh, third, second one was three or fewer servings of red meat a week. I can do that. You know, I, yeah, I can do that. Third, five to seven servings of fruit or vegetables a day. Not possible. That is just not possible. <laughs> <laughs> it just can't be done. Uh, it's way too many bananas. Come on, think about it. Seven bananas a day so doesn't work. No. Thank God for these fruit smoothie things that have like three servings in a bowl that save my life. Uh, and the fourth was 10,000 steps a day. And so I, you know, for six months I was on the trial, but I you know, record the results. If I didn't record the results, if I was below, I got a call from Maria, the health coach. Rah, 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 rah. So, and I got back on it because the calls from Maria were annoying. And I remember Yale, remember me, was sort of walking around the seventh floor of HHS doing my stupid steps. Uh, and I still do them today. Uh, now, I was wondering, why did I do this? You know, why did, and you got to be careful with an N of one. But nonetheless, it's me, so it matters. Uh, you know, why did I do, adopt these four behaviors? One is I had medical, there's enough medical literature to say it makes sense. There's data on the value of walking, you know, and there's, this is good, you know, there's enough there. The second, I needed tactical knowledge. Uh, and if I tactical knowledge, I remember asking Maria, because I was failing on the fruits or vegetables, do onion rings count? <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. She had no sense of humor. I said, well, how about coffee grows on the ground? How about a cup of coffee? <coughs> that doesn't count yet. But I had to know. I had to know what's the tech. I, knew, I had to know tactically. I play racquetball. How many steps do you get for an hour? I had the tactical knowledge that had to go on. Third, I needed technology. But what is it that I need? A $40 pedometer and a website. That's it. I don't even need Bluetooth on this stupid thing. Uh, and the fourth was a motivational structure. What caused me every day to wake up and say, I'm going to get my damn 10,000 steps? You know, I'm the kind of guy, 30 minutes till midnight, blizzard, uh, minus 5,000 degrees. I'm going to get my damn steps, you know, for reasons that are beyond me. Uh, I'm going to have to do this. So I look at engaging patients and say there's, at times, and not necessarily, but certainly in the IT conversation, we zero in on the pedometer as if that's the answer. It's a much more complicated thing to do. So, you know, across these range of factors is, still learning about how best to engage patients and using the technology where appropriately without overstating it. Second point here is, uh, second on this graph, is it's amazing to me the HIE is a blessing and a curse. Uh, it certainly brought data to the attention of a physician, data they may not have been aware of otherwise. You know, seen here, allergy there, et cetera. Uh, but it also brought a huge array of junk uh, in together. And so you find as a result of conversion to data, the data says patients type 1 and type 2 diabetic. Can't be that they're both, but that's what the data says. There's gaps in the data. Uh, problem list says they're diabetic, but there's no evidence of insulin or any hemoglobin A1C test ever taken. There's clearly in the note in the lab they had a heart attack. You don't see that in the problem. So it's cleaning up the data uh, that goes with this and using a series of novel analytic techniques where the machine says, look, if there's an inconsistency, and I think it's X, you know, having roamed through the series of data to go off and find this. So you find this, you know, problems are incomplete, notes are incomplete, all kinds of stuff. So using ways and novel ways to clean up the data without requiring a team to go through these things and identify this side or the other. The other point is sort of corollary, is the last one here, is that a number of things that are just over. Information is just, if searching is just too messy still. You know the drill. Type in diabetes in your favorite search engine. How many things do you get? The unbelievable uh, what you get here. It's still too hard to zero in on the healthcare question that I have, like do onion rings count? Uh, I have to talk to a human being. Uh, I love to do this stuff. So there is a work on better search for highly ambiguous, complicated questions that needs to be occurred here. Finding data, if you're a physician and you, you know, remember at one point I thought the physicians complained this is a partner's health care. I have to go through 30 notes. Too much. I can't have time for it. Shoot, through the HIE, we made it 200. Boy, we didn't solve the problem at all. We just made it intractable, you know, <laughs> fundamentally uh, to go up and do this. So finding data and having the machine help you uh, make stuff salient. Um, and then also in part of our discourse, we talk about clinical data and the standards to move that forward. Terrific. We ought to do that. Um, we're missing a category called events, which is seen in the emergency room. 
skipped an appointment. These are events. They are clinical relevance, but they are particular events. So there's a series of informatics challenges dealing with keeping the data clean, engaging patients, and things like that. And that's all that I have. So I am going to stop here and see if there's any questions, comments, or discourse that results from that. So thank you. Okay. You, you pointed out how larger organizations are doing better with meaningful use, and then you said how difficult it is to go across organizational boundaries. Do you think that the drive for population health management will, necess will necessarily drive vertical integration of the healthcare industry? Uh, the vertical, and by vertical, I mean more and more hospitals. Uh, you, you, okay. Hospitals. Uh, yeah, long-term yes. home health yes. all under the same umbrella. They will do that, yes. So, so they can have control over the environment. I suspect, and what I don't know in any sort of formation of the ACO, you guys may know this, is to what degree the ACOs are being formed around an ownership model versus a contractual model. Because the contractual model is a lot easier to put together, a lot lower risk, a lot less expensive, et cetera. So this organized model, we are seeing people form on these things, contractual and ownership model to try and cover this continuum. I'm not surprised by that. No matter how you do it, there's care on the other side. You know, and so you're still confronted with this model of sharing across care boundaries. But to answer your point, it's one of the drivers behind uh, the consolidation industry is getting ready for this. Frankly, sort of side note here, a lot of what you see <coughs> is anticipatory. You know, the people are anticipating population management, so they're forming the ACO in anticipation of. Then let's say the payments change, but anticipation of. I think a lot of the EHR adoption going on now, above and beyond meaningful use, is anticipation of a series of things. You know, said I got to get ready, so it's taking a while to go out and do this. So we're seeing anticipatory moves at our consolidation. John? So first, thank you, Washington Master of Work. Um, uh, so second, so uh, this is set out some great framework. I'd like to um, transition for a second from uh, John Lazarus Salon to John Lazarus Salon. Okay. Um, how can we structure um, research that you're talking about here in such a way that when you know, Dr. Grant publishes a paper, okay, uh, that uh, somebody, whether it's me or other folks, can take it to you, CEO of Siemens, and say, how do we turn this into product? How do we turn this into stuff that it gets more out of the hospital? Well, I think, John, that you know, uh, most people on the sort of vendor side, you know, try hard to have good re you know, ties to the academic community, to the research community, so they can absorb and bring in these new ideas. Um, I do think there's a broad issue. I was talking to the folks from EMEA yesterday about how there's still a gap between the academic informatics community and the practitioner. And sometimes, boy, you think you're on two separate planets and there's no discourse. Um, but they do try to you know, work through to make sure that we can bring that stuff in. It obviously helps to have formal relationships. It always helps to have personal relationships where you know, I know if you call me, I'll recall you back and you know, things along those lines to go off and to do this. And I think you know, most of the vendors are actually quite comfortable with the fact that a lot of this will be public knowledge. You know, we'll be better and everybody will be better, but that's just the way the academic process works. Um, and so you've got to realize that that's uh, part of the stuff. So I think there are ways to do that and, and, and generally it matters to all of us. We keep tied to the research <coughs> applied and basic that's going on across the board. So, a lot of your talk was just very, very good. Uh, it was focused on providers and clinical workers. So, where, where does public health fit in um, to some of the major points you talked about? It's hard, hard yeah. enough to share data across SEOs, across clinical organizational boundaries. Um, how do we engage with? Well, I think, you know, in, um, I don't mean to mess up somebody's stuff here, um, but if I have, you know, we've got Mrs. Smith's plan, okay? And we've got one through 20 of the things we need her to do as part of this kind of stuff. Some of which are public health. <coughs> she smokes, okay? Or, you know, or she, frankly, we've got to beat her up because she doesn't use her seat, but whatever you think the public health intervention series of things is. So in most people, there's a public health angle. There's some that it's not, it's clinical. So my belief is that the health care providers are forming these systems. I need relations with the public health community because I gotta, this is part of our plan and I want to do it well. So I need to reach out to them and, and make sure I understand the programs, how to get the programs available to her, and this, that, and the other. There's a separate conversation of how much interoperability do I need. Now clearly there's some reporting to be done, you know, and there's some mandatory reporting about certain types of folks show up in the emergency room, you've got to report a variety of things along those lines. 
So I think the basic is in the construction of the plan. If I'm going to do a good job of managing these things, and they are public health, I need to make sure I know how the resources exist, they're available, and I get them, my doctors and nurses are aware of them, uh, and I make sure that Mrs. Smith is aware of them. And that's where the, the collaboration would come in. <coughs> I fully understand the sort of connections that result from that. Uh, obviously, if to the degree I'm capturing data and reporting it, I can give public health, this is what, you know, where I stand in my people who are smokers and are now trying to stop and how well I've done that. So it becomes an aggregator of the data on the part of quite accountable care organizations, lowercase a, c, and o, uh, that are trying to do this stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there's a talk in thinking about social services, which most patients find the effect of the I don't see that, I'm not sure how, we don't tend not to talk about the social services. We can focus on the medical issues. Right. We can talk about the realities system. Well, if you say, if I purely, you say, all right, there's one model that I have about patients, which is more holistic, you know, in the WHO sense of more holistic and social services are equivalent or equal footing of uh, the medical service. So even in a pure medical services model, if I say, listen, uh, I've got a plan for Mrs. Smith, but we're at risk here because of certain social the, the background that she has. She's poor. Uh, she's got dementia. She's who can't get somewhere, you know, or you know, whatever. She's illiterate, you know, whatever. I need social services to drop the risk that I will, you know, associated with my medical plan here. And so, if I see risk factors that can be resolved through social services, then just like I'm doing with the public health folks, I need to be talking to the social services guys because they can help me drop the risk associated with this plan. Anything on this? Okay. In the back. Yeah. Are you suggesting that the next ten years are going to be perhaps the most one of the most dynamic periods in healthcare and change? And then you also said that change is basically fundamental to in organizations and institutions to uh, facilitating this dynamism. So, can you give us some concrete example in the provider setting, in the public health setting? And especially in the insurance industry setting of how this is all going to come together. How, how do we educate these organizations to, to facilitate and use public change? Well, I think there is a skill set, uh, and it's an organizational skill set of uh, being able to manage change, you know, understand it, to know how to mobilize politically, to bring in new behaviors, to reward and send to deal with bugs. There's a skill set that organizations have, and it's the skill set of the collection. Uh, more so than the skill set of a particular individual. A lot of organizations have not had to go through much change. They might have had to deal with DRGs, and that was challenging for them, but not to the degree we're talking about here. So part of it is just your ability to change. Raw, whatever the change happens to be. And in a way, say, I actually don't need to know the destination 10 years out. What I do need to know is to know at any point in time, do I have to change, and change to what? in the next iteration or step. So I will iterate my way, both as an organization and we as a country, to a destination which is a reflection of the experiences, good, bad, and indifferent along the way here. It's difficult to predict outcome, difficult to predict pace, but I know I'm going to go through several iterations of perhaps material material change you know, along the way with some misdirections. Along the way. So my basic belief it is the inherent organizational property of being able to manage change, which is the critical thing. Doesn't preclude the utility of having a destination in mind, but also is, is humble and sanguine enough about the certainty of that destination. And one of the things I worry about as a citizen, as a member of this broader community, we, you know, when we all talk about all this stuff's going to make care better, we also have the ability to break it. I mean, fundamentally take a broken system and break it. I mean, really break it. Uh, and terrific, just when I'm getting old. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, in fact, my Eldest daughter is doing a residency in Penn. I think, thank God. Prescriptions and access to specialists. That's all I need. Thank you. Pay <laughs> back for the years I invested in you. Uh, no, because if you change in the wrong way, you get a bunch of physicians who say, fooey on this nonsense. You know, it's too regulated. I have to do this and that. And I don't like the ZHR stuff. Fooey on this nonsense. And particularly when you have 55% of the practicing physicians in this, or 20% of the practicing physicians in this country are 55 or older. That's, that's easy. I mean, that, you, know, you get your 401k back to where it used to be in 2007, and you're good, uh, and you're out of here. The other is the example is in the state of Tennessee, three quarters of the hospitals are losing money. How much, you know, and they're probably minus one, minus two on the operating margin. Shoot, you get to be minus five you, for a prolonged period. It's over. So that's what I worry about is, is that we got to be careful that we, we iterate our way to an intelligent, but iterative way, uh, and don't get over there. Okay. So I really like your emphasis on change management. Yeah. And having spent a lot of time in Fortune 100 companies, 
We have a lot of emphasis in change management. We are trained in change management. We have consultants who come in with research about change management for Fortune 100 companies. I'm not aware of much research that's been done for change management in the healthcare system or in the public health system. So maybe that's an, uh, that's a research agenda that we should be pushing because um, even if we get all the IT right, um, if, as we say, doctors are not ready for doing it with population health management, or providers are not really ready for it, without, doing, without really giving them tools to do change management, I, I would fully agree. And you know, one of the reasons that you know, a couple of reasons why you know systems are being formed, the scale and the size of one of this notion is a, is economy of skill, is that I can take a small number of talented people and really leverage them across the base. Where if you're all on your own, you just there's no way you could get them. So I think some research about how do you bring change into, you know, golly, a critical access hospital, 25 beds, you know, far away from the major med, and how do you do that? And good people trying to do the right thing, all the kinds of stuff we've had before. So I don't know <coughs> the right answer. I think when in retrospect, looking back on the meaningful use program, there was a conceptual flaw in that. Uh, and one of the flaws was that if you introduce the HR, they would know what to do with it. Uh, a lot of times they do, but a lot of times they don't know what to check. You know, I got my numbers and, you know, send me the paycheck here. So I think we'd be saying about it. The other thing I think mindful of here, although healthcare is a different thing, and you guys have seen the statistics, if you look at the um, Fortune 100 and the volatility of the Fortune 100, it is off the charts in terms of, you know, 20 years ago, who was in there and who is no longer there. And all of a sudden you got these Facebook and all these other things in there. But the rate at which companies, big companies, strong companies, golly, Fortune 100, that's hard to get there disappeared stunning, I mean a stunning uptick uh, in the Darwinian process called competitive destruction or destructive conflict, whatever it is, you get with the drift here. Uh, and so you say, you know, that is, uh, we ought to be aware of the fact that not only is change hard in smaller organizations, but we're heading into a period which is going to be much more Darwinian than it's been before. Uh, and we've got to be careful with this thing because it's okay if some company disappears, that you know, Sears disappears, too bad. Uh, but on the other hand, we can't really afford to have lots of hospitals disappear. Um, and so this will be part of the challenge about how we manage the change as a policy matter, realizing we're entering into this accelerated period of Darwinism uh, in which we have a whole lot of our players poorly equipped to handle what they're about to have to deal with. And so on that perky note, I will. Uh, <laughs>